An Ironic Tale, The Informer, by Joseph Conrad, read by Donald Miller. Mr. X came to me, preceded by a letter of introduction from a good friend of mine in Paris, specifically to see my collection of Chinese bronzes and porcelain. My friend in Paris is a collector, too. He collects neither porcelain, nor bronzes, nor pictures, nor medals, nor stamps, nor anything that could be profitably dispersed under an auctioneer's hammer. He would reject, with genuine surprise, the name of a collector. Nevertheless, that's what he is by temperament. He collects acquaintances. It is delicate work. He brings to it the patience, the passion, the determination of a true collector of curiosities. His collection does not contain any royal personages. I don't think he considers them sufficiently rare and interesting. But, with that exception, he has met with and talked to everyone worth knowing on any conceivable ground. He observes them, listens to them, penetrates them, measures them, and puts the memory away in the galleries of his mind. He has schemed plotted and traveled all over Europe in order to add to his collection of distinguished personal acquaintances. As he is wealthy, well-connected, and unprejudiced, his collection is pretty complete, including objects, or should I say subjects, whose value is unappreciated by the vulgar and often unknown by popular fame of modern times. The world knows him as a revolutionary writer whose savage irony has laid bare the rottenness of the most respectable institutions. He has scalped every venerated head and has mangled at the stake of his wit every received opinion and every recognized principle of conduct and policy, who does not remember his flaming red revolutionary pamphlets, their sudden swarmings used to overwhelm the powers of every continental police like a plague of crimson gadflies. But this extreme writer has been also the active inspirer of secret societies, the mysterious unknown number one of desperate conspiracies, suspected and unsuspected, matured or baffled, and the world at large has never had an inkling of that fact. This accounts for him going about amongst us to this day, a veteran of many subterranean campaigns, standing aside now, safe within his reputation of merely the greatest destructive publicist that ever lived. Thus wrote my friend, adding that Mr. X was an enlightened connoisseur of bronzes and china, and asking me to show him my collection. X turned up in due course. My treasures are disposed in three large rooms without carpets and curtains. There is no other furniture than the etigris and the glass cases whose contents shall be worth a fortune to my heirs. I allow no fires to be lighted, for fear of accidents, and a fireproof door separates them from the rest of the house. It was a bitter cold day. We kept on our overcoats and hats. Middle-sized and spare, his eyes alert in a long, Roman-nosed countenance, X walked on his neat little feet with short steps, and looked at my collection intelligently. I hope I look at him intelligently, too. A snow-white mustache and imperial made his nut-brown complexion appear darker than it really was. In his fur coat and shiny tail hat, the terrible man looked fashionable. I believe he belonged to a noble family and could have called himself Vicomte X de la X if he chose. We talked nothing but bronzes and porcelain. He was remarkably appreciative. We parted on cordial terms. Where he was staying, I don't know. I imagine he must have been a lonely man. Anarchists, I suppose, have no families. 
not at any rate as we understand that social relation. Organization into families may answer to a need of human nature, but in the last instance it is based on law and therefore must be something odious and impossible to an anarchist. But indeed, I don't understand anarchists. Does a man of that, of that persuasion, still remain an anarchist when alone, quite alone, and going to bed, for instance? Does he lay his head on the pillow, pull his bedcloths over him, and go to sleep with the necessity of the chambardement general, as the French slang has it, of the general blow-up, always present to his mind? And if so, how can he? I am sure that if such a faith, or such a fanaticism, once mastered my thoughts, I would never be able to compose myself sufficiently to sleep, or eat, or perform any of the routine acts of daily life. I would want no wife, no children, I could have no friends, it seems to me, and as to collecting bronzes or china, that, I should say, would be quite out of the question. But I don't know. All I know is that Mr. X took his meals in a very good restaurant, which I frequented also. With his head uncovered, the silver top knot of his brushed-up hair completed the character of his physiognomy, all bones, ridges, and sunken hollows clothed in a perfect impassiveness of expression, his meager brown hands emerging from large white cuffs came and went breaking bread pouring wine and so on with quiet mechanical precision his head and body above the tablecloth had a rigid immobility this firebrand this great agitator exhibited the least possible amount of warmth and animation his voice was rasping cold and monotonous in a low key he could not be called a talkative personality, but with his detached calm manner he appeared as ready to keep the conversation going as to drop it at any moment, and his conversation was by no means commonplace. To me, I own, there was some excitement in talking quietly across the dinner table with a man whose venomous pen stabs had sapped the vitality of at least one monarchy. That much was a matter of public knowledge. But I knew more, I knew of him, for my friend, as a certainty what the guardians of social order in Europe had at most only suspected, or dimly guessed at. He had had what I may call his underground life, and as I sat, evening after evening, facing him at dinner, a curiosity in that direction would naturally rise in my mind. I am a quiet and peaceable product of civilization, and know no passion other than the passion for collecting things which are rare, and must remain exquisite, even if approaching to the monstrous. Some Chinese bronzes are monstrously precious, and here, out of my friend's collection, here I had before me a kind of rare monster. It is true that this monster was polished, and in a sense even exquisite. His beautiful unruffled manner was that, but when he was not of bronze, he was not even Chinese, which would have enabled one to contemplate him calmly across the gulf of racial difference. He was alive and European, he had the manner of good society, wore a coat and hat like mine, and had pretty near the same taste in cooking. It was too frightful to think of. One evening, he remarked casually in the course of conversation, there is no amendment to be got out of mankind except by terror and violence. You can imagine the effect of such a phrase out of such a man's mouth upon a person like myself, whose whole scheme of life had been based upon a suave and delicate discrimination of social and artistic values. Just imagine, upon me, to whom all sorts and forms of violence appear as unreal as the giants, ogres, and seven-headed hydras whose activities affect 
fantastically the course of legends and fairy tales. I seem suddenly to hear above the festive bustle and clatter of the brilliant restaurant the mutter of a hungry and seditious multitude. I suppose I am impressionable and imaginative. I had a disturbing vision of darkness, full of lean jaws and wild eyes, amongst the hundred electric lights of the place. But somehow this vision made me angry, too. The sight of that man, so calm, breaking bits of white bread, exasperated me, and I had the audacity to ask him how it was that the starving proletariat of Europe, to whom he had been preaching revolt and violence, had not been made indignant by his openly luxurious life. At all this, I said pointedly, with a glance round the room and at the bottle of champagne we generally shared between us at dinner. He remained unmoved. Do I feed on their toil and their heart's blood? Am I a spectator or a capitalist? Did I steal my fortune from a starving people? No. They know this very well, and they envy me nothing. The miserable mass of the people is generous to its leaders. What I have acquired has come to me through my writings, not from the millions of pamphlets distributed gratis to the hungry and the oppressed, but from the hundreds of thousands of copies sold to the well-fed bourgeoisie. You know that my writings were at one time the rage, the fashion, the thing to read with wonder and horror, to turn your eyes up at my pathos, or else to laugh in ecstasies at my wit. Yes, I admitted, I remember, of course, and I confess frankly that I could never understand that infatuation. Don't you know yet, he said, that an idle and selfish class loves to see mischief being made, even if it is made at its own expense, its own life being all a matter of pose and gesture. It is unable to realize the power and the danger of a real movement and of words that have no sham meaning. It is all fun and sentiment. It is sufficient, for instance, to point out the attitude of the old French aristocracy towards the philosophers whose words were preparing the great revolution. Even in England, where you have some common sense, a demagogue has only to shout loud enough and long enough to find some backing and the very class he is shouting at. You, too, like to see mischief being made. The demagogue carries the amateurs of emotion with him. Amateurism in this that and the other thing is a delightfully easy way of killing time and feeding one's own vanity, the silly vanity of being abreast with the ideas of the day after tomorrow. Just as good and otherwise harmless people will join you in ecstasies over your collection without having the slightest notion in what its marvelousness really consists. I hung my head. It was a crushing illustration of the sad truth he advanced. The world is full of such people. And that instance of the French aristocracy before the revolution was extremely telling, too. I could not traverse his statement, though its cynicism, always a distasteful trait, took off much of its value to my mind. However, I admit I was impressed. I felt the need to say something which would not be in the nature of assent and yet would not invite discussion. You don't mean to say, I observed airily, that extreme revolutionists have ever been actively assisted by the infatuation of such people. I did not mean exactly that by what I just said. Now, I generalized. But since you ask me, I may tell you that such help has been given to revolutionary activities, more or less consciously, in various countries, and even in this country. Impossible, I protested with firmness. We don't play with fire to that extent. And yet you can better afford it than others, perhaps. But let me observe that most women, 
if not always ready to play with fire, are generally eager to play with a loose spark or so. Is this a joke, I asked, smiling? If it is, I am not aware of it, he said woodenly. I was thinking of an instance, oh, mild enough in a way. I became all expectation at this. I had tried many times to approach him on this underground side, so to speak. The very word had been pronounced between us. But he had always met me with his impenetrable calm. And at the same time, Mr. X continued, it will give you a notion of the difficulties that may arise in what you are pleased to call underground work. It is sometimes difficult to deal with them. Of course, there is no hierarchy amongst the affiliated, no rigid system. My surprise was great, but short-lived. Clearly, amongst extreme anarchists, there could be no hierarchy, nothing in the nature of a law of precedence. The idea of anarchy ruling among anarchists was comforting. It could not possibly make for efficiency. Mr. X startled me by asking abruptly, You know Hermione Street? I nodded, doubtful assent. Hermione Street has been within the last three years, improved out of any man's knowledge. The name exists still, but not one brick or stone of the old Hermion Street is left now. It was the old street, he meant, for he said, there was a row of two-storied brick houses on the left, with their backs against the wing of a great public building, you remember. Would it surprise you very much to hear that one of these buildings was for a time the center of anarchist propaganda and of what you would call underground action? Not at all, I declared. Hermion Street had never been particularly respectable as I remembered it. The house was the property of a distinguished governmental official, he added, sipping his champagne. Oh, indeed, I said, this time, not believing a word of it. Of course he was not living there, Mr. X continued, but from ten till four he sat next door to it, the dear man, in his well-appointed private room in the wing of the public building I've mentioned. To be strictly accurate, I must explain that the house in Hermion Street did not really belong to him. It belonged to his grown-up children, a daughter, and a son, the girl, a fine figure, was by no means vulgarly pretty. To more personal charm than mere youth could account for, she added the seductive appearance of enthusiasm, of independence, of courageous thought. I suppose she put on these appearances as she put on her picturesque dresses, and for the same reason, to assert her individuality at any cost. You know, women would go to any length, almost, for such a purpose. She went to a great length. She had acquired all the appropriate gestures of revolutionary convictions, the gestures of pity, of anger, of indignation against the anti-humanitarian vices of the social class to which she belonged herself. All this sat on her striking personality, as well as her slightly original costumes. Very slightly original, just enough to make a protest against the Philistinism of the overfed taskmasters of the poor. Just enough and no more. It would not have done to go too far in that direction, you understand. But she was of age and nothing stood in the way of her offering her house to the revolutionary workers. You don't mean it, I cried. I assure you, he affirmed, that she made that very practical gesture. How else could they have got hold of it? The cause is not rich, and, moreover, there would have been difficulties with any ordinary house agent who would have wanted references and so on. The group she came in contact with, while exploring the poor quarters of the town, you know, the gesture of charity and personal service which was so fashionable some years ago, accepted with gratitude. The first advantage was that Hermion Street is, as you know, 
well away from the suspect part of the town, specially watched by the police. The ground floor consisted of a little Italian restaurant of the fly-blown sort. There was no difficulty in buying the proprietor out. A woman and a man belonging to the group took it on. The man had been a cook. The comrades get their meals there, unnoticed amongst the other customers. This was another advantage. The first floor was occupied by a shabby variety artist's agency. An agency for performers in inferior music halls, you know. A fellow called Baum, I remember. He was not disturbed. It was rather favorable than otherwise to have a lot of foreign-looking people, jugglers, acrobats, singers of both sexes, and so on, going in and out all day long. The police paid no attention to new faces, you see. The top floor happened, most conveniently, to stand empty then. X interrupted himself to attack impassively with measured movements a bombi glacis which the waiter had just set down on the table. He swallowed carefully a few spoonfuls of the iced sweet and asked me, Did you ever hear of the stone's dried soup? Hear of what? It was, X pursued, evenly, a comfortable article once rather prominently advertised in the dailies, but which never somehow gained the favor of the public. The enterprise fizzled out, as you say here. Parcels of their stock could be picked up at auctions at considerably less than a penny a pound. The group bought some of it, and an agency for Stone's Dried Soup was started on the top floor. A perfectly respectable business. The stuff, a yellow powder of extremely unappetizing aspect, was put up in large square tins, of which six went to a case. If anybody ever came to give an order, it was, of course, executed. But the advantage of the powder was this that things could be concealed in it, very conveniently. Now and then a special case got up on a van and sent off to be exported abroad, under the very nose of the policeman on duty at the corner. You understand? I think I do, I said, with an imp expressive nod at the remnants of Bombay melting slowly in the dish. Exactly, but the cases were useful in another way, too. In the basement, or in the cellar at the back, rather two printing presses were established. A lot of revolutionary literature of the most inflammatory kind was got away from the house in Stone's dried soup cases. The brother of our anarchist young lady found some occupation there. He wrote articles, helped to set up type, and pull off sheets, and generally assisted the man in charge, a very able young fellow called Severin. The guiding spirit of that group was a fanatic of social revolution. He is dead now. He was an engraver and etcher of genius. You must have seen his work. It is much sought after by certain amateurs now. He began as being revolutionary in his art and ended by becoming a revolutionist. After his wife and child had died in want and misery, he used to say that the bourgeoisie, the smug, overfed lot, had killed them. That was his real belief. He still worked at his art and led a double life. He was tall, gaunt, and swarthy, with a long brown beard and deep-set eyes. You must have seen him. His name was Henri. At this I was really startled. Of course, years ago, I used to meet Henri about. He looked like a powerful, rough gypsy in an old top hat with a red muffler around his throat and buttoned up in a long, shabby overcoat. He talked of his art with exaltation and gave one the impression of being strung up to the verge of insanity. A small group of connoisseurs appreciated his work. Who would have thought that this man, amazing, 
and yet it was not, after all, so difficult to believe. As you see, X went on, this group was in a position to pursue its work of propaganda, and the other kind of work, too, under very advantageous conditions. They were all resolute, experienced men of a superior stamp, and yet we became struck at length by the fact that plans prepared in Hermione Street almost invariably failed. Who were we? I asked pointedly. Some of us in Brussels at the center, he said hastily. Whatever vigorous action originated in Hermione Street seemed doomed to failure. Something always happened to baffle the best planned manifestations in every part of Europe. It was a time of general activity. You must not imagine that all our failures are of a loud sort, with arrests and trials. That is not so. Often the police work quietly, almost secretly, defeating our combinations by clever counter-plotting. No arrests, no noise, no alarming of the public mind and inflaming the passions. It is a wise procedure. But at that time, the police were too uniformly successful from the Mediterranean to the Baltic. It was annoying and began to look dangerous. At last, we came to the conclusion that there must be some untrustworthy elements amongst the London groups, and I came over here to see what could be done quietly.